Hello everyone, you are listening to Javid Aga and today we have a special guest on our podcast. His name is Alexander Kaftaradze. Today he is my guest or actually I'm his guest. Um, yes, um, thank you first of all um, for this opportunity. My name is Alexander Kaftaradze, as you mentioned. I, I was born in Georgia. I live in Georgia, um, but I'm of partially Udi descent through my maternal grandmother who was born in Zinobiani, which is the only Udi village in Georgia. Her ancestors, uh, her parents actually, a generation came to Georgia about 100 years ago in 1922 from Oruz, Azerbaijan, which was called Vartashen back then, and settled here in Kacheti region of Georgia. So, Alexander, please, what can you tell a little bit about uh, the history of Udis in Georgia? How did you come here or were you here at all? Um, yes. Mm. So, um, well, it all happened about 100 years ago. Actually, um, as far as we know uh, from the sources that we have, the first official request for, from Moody's of Azerbaijan to be settled in Georgia came in 1920. Um, and that was back then. Back then it was the, the Democratic Republic of Georgia. Uh, but at that point, uh, their request... Uh, didn't really go through. So they, they didn't really manage to come during that year in 1920. But after the Soviets came in, uh, in the region, in the entire region, uh, including Georgia, their request uh, from the Svartasheni Udis, or part of them, to move to Georgia was actually, they were permitted uh, to, to come here and settle here. They were offered several places. At last, they, they settled on, on one of those places, which is in now in Kacheti region in Kvareli municipality and the place is called Zinobiani now. They um, came here, uh, most of them came here in 1922 and um, they started building the village from the scratch. Uh, there was nothing there, the place where they, they built, started building the village. They were led here by Zinobi Silikashvili, who was around 32 years old at that point. Uh, initially, actually, from uh, what we know from the oral stories that we have, is that he was planning to bring only his relatives here. Uh, and the reason why they decided to come here, why part of this, part of the Udis in modern day Oros, or what was called Vartashen back then, decided to come here, was that because there was a, a, a conflict uh, between Armenians and Azeris in those areas, and Udis. Uh, got caught up in this uh, and nobody really knew about uh, about them that much so it was a really confusing and complicated situation for them for most of them and many of them suffered during those years and many of them were killed actually some of the relatives of Zinobi Silikashvili including so uh, but afterwards so um, actually a huge number of Udi's, Udi families decided from Vatash and from Oros decided to, to come with Zinobi. They really asked him to, to bring them here. So they decided to, to, to move in 1922, as I, as I mentioned. They settled um, in Kvareli municipality. Back then it was called uh, uh, Tel Aviv Mazra. And they started building the village. But the very next year, in 1923, actually, the grateful Udi's who moved here, uh, decided to, when they were thinking about the name of the village, actually nowadays we know that they also had several options. They, one of the options was they wanted to call the village New Vartasheni. But then they opted out for another option and they called the place Zinobiani after the man who led them here, Zinobi Silikashvili. As I mentioned, he was only 32 years old at that point when they actually called the village Zinobiani. He was helping out the community um, uh, to actually in the process of building the village and uh, building several factories even uh, at the place and electricity, school and so and so on. He was really concerned about the education and humanitarian aid to the newly arrived duties. Uh, he involved the Georgian society in helping uh, the newcomers. They established an organization called um, the Helping Organization, the Aid Organization of Georgian Udis. Um, and it operated for several years and had different branches in different cities and they helped them out. And that's how they started and how, how they came to Georgia initially. So uh, what, what can you tell about the knowledge of Udi language in modern uh, Zinobiani or 
uh, how was it before and what's the current situation and uh, please yes so um uh, initially when the Uris came only a handful of them knew georgian uh, some of them who were educated maybe in tbilisi beforehand or had some connections here they knew georgian some of them knew very little but most of them didn't know any Georgian whatsoever when they came. So, they, for example, the first generations, my great-grandfather, for example, died in 1953 without learning Georgian. So the first generations didn't even, most of them didn't even know Georgian unless they had some connections with the Georgians or when they arrived, if some of them started to having some, uh, uh, some you know, relationships with the Georgians, local Georgians ar uh, around them because there were some Georgian villages around them. Um, but other than that, most of the first generation, they actually, the first spoken language or the first language was obviously Udi, the language that they communicated in at the, the home and everywhere in the village. But eventually, uh, there were growing number of mixed families, Georgian and Udi families. Um, so Udis and Georgians started intermarrying. That meant that the newer generations, the people who were born to those families, most of them no longer spoke Georgian at home. There were only a few exceptions where actually we still have some people who, who are Georgian women, mostly women, Georgian women, who married Udi men, who actually learned Udi language. Uh, but there were only exceptions. And in most of these mixed families, they actually spoke Georgian. Because of that, that there was a huge challenge um, for the community. Uh, when it came to preservation of the language and they started communicating with other Georgians obviously outside of the village some of them started moving out moving to the cities or other villages that meant that it really took its toll on the language and nowadays the situation is really uh, quite dire in the sense that only few exceptions when it comes to younger generations we have only few exceptions who actually can speak and understand Udi language most of the younger people no longer are able to understand or even speak Udi language. Some of them know a few words, some of them understand more than they can speak, but most of them really don't, don't have any good command of the Udi language. Uh, in that regard, it's a really challenging situation at the moment. Uh, they're only older generations, some of the older generations, they still speak Udi um, in their homes, in their, their families. But most of the time, actually, the language of communication in the village of Zinobiani is currently becoming more and more Georgian. And, uh, I mean, you set up, a, actually, NGO, I guess, we call. And can you talk about the, some of the actions you have done? What, uh, what, the, what, or, uh, what are you doing in your organization? Yes. Um, yes. Um, as you mentioned, we, a few years ago, actually, we set up an organization with our friends called Civic Call which actually is um, uh, mostly uh, focusing on educational culture projects in different regions of Georgia uh, and also working on presenting the diversity of the country and preserving this diversity. And that actually prompted two members of this organization, including me and another young girl from the Udi community, to actually set up a local organization for the Georgian Udi community called the Georgian Udis. Through this organization, we want to locally in Zinobiani and for the Udi community in Georgia to carry out some of the cultural educational projects, also other obviously initiatives, but mostly focusing also on preserving the language, preserving this unique or separate identity that the Udi community has, which is nowadays is connected mostly, at least in Georgia, especially connected to the Udi language itself. Um, and uh, we also have some different initiatives, for example, um, we are now finishing up uh, installing a sculpture to the, the first leader of the Georgian Udi community called Zino Bisilikashvili that I mentioned. Uh, there will be an adjacent information plaque next to the sculpture in Georgian and English for the visitors to learn more not only about Zino Bisilikashvili but also about the Udi community and about their uh, the Caucasian Albanian and the Albanians, the ancestors of the, the Udis. Um, and this uh, information, as I mentioned, will be presented both in Georgian and English. So international visitors can also um, read uh, what, what's written there. Um, and we also have some other initiatives because next year, actually, we are celebrating 100 years of um, Udis uh, moving to Georgia and, and settling in Zinobiani gradually. 
uh, and we are planning to to um, to have some activities next year. Obviously, um, if we are allowed and if, if everything is is going well with the pandemic, um, then obviously most of the activities will go through. But even without that, we we still have some backup plans, and we are planning to. Um, actually uh, do a number of really interesting activities in Zinobiani and outside of it also to raise awareness about the Udi community but also about the Udi language. That gives us some hope I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, besides the language I would like to ask about some uh, cultural like traditions like specific to Udi's. Uh, how much of it has been kept since the, the move to Georgia? Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, actually, uh, in, uh, initially, uh, as with many other things and as with the language, most of the traditions that they had back in Azerbaijan, they, they just brought with them. So everything that they had back there, they would have it here. Uh, when it came to the weddings, when it came to the funerals, when it came to the cuisine and other traditions. Um, some of these have been preserved especially when it comes to cuisine, for example. So you would go to the families today in Zinobiani and most of these older generations or middle-aged even uh, generation, people belonging to the, this group, age group, uh, they still make these uh, different um, Udi dishes. Um, they still, uh, sometimes some of these dishes, actually at least one of them is connected to a specific time, for example, when they, it is the last Sunday before the Great Lent starts and they they still have that most of the families still do that on that specific sunday um, they also for example because of the pandemic that stopped for a while but they there's another tradition of going to the uh, the la on the last sunday of september which is coming up they're going to the cemetery usually and having a huge feast there which i think is somehow connected to the pre-christian times uh, and maybe it's connected to the harvest, um, uh, you know, period and, and so and so on. So there are some traditions that are still there, although it is worrying, obviously, that the with the also with the loss of language, the traditions are also uh, will be vanishing when it comes to younger generations. Uh, and that's what we are hoping to do that to to help preserve some of these traditions um, that are still around and that we still have and continue them um, down the road. How do you see the uh, uh, opportunity to use social media or like uh, another mediums like music or uh, films, movies, uh, in order to preserve this culture? Uh, do you think that uh, we can use these opportunities? Uh, I think these are essential actually in, in this day and age, uh, especially social networks. What we found actually uh, when we started this, uh, you know, Georgian Udi organization especially, uh, for example, uh, and we started writing about, you know, the, the history of Udi's or language of Udi's, introducing some of the words and some of the history and culture and so and so on, and posting some of the old photos and stuff. We found out that there was a growing interest even within the Georgian society, even outside of the Udi community, to the point that actually in recent months, we have had already about several TV stations, national TV stations visiting Zinobiani, connecting uh, to the local people via our activities and via our page uh, on Facebook and then asking us where they can go, what can they film and who can they talk to. So we did definitely found that the social network, be network became a, a really important and essential um, thing for us in this, in this regard. But also, again, I mean, when it comes to music and art, I think that would be also very, very important for such a small community. Um, you know, on one hand, uh, to present itself to the rest of the society, but also raise awareness um, you know, when it comes um, to its position, you know, within the society. Because Udis today, especially in Georgia, are actually one of the smallest commu ethnic communities in the country. And most of the families, as I mentioned, are now mixed families, Georgian Udi families. So again, to go back to the question, yes, I think that this social network and music and art, that would be essential as we go forward. Yep. Uh, talking about uh, mixed families, you know, back in the day when uh, during the Soviet period, uh, there has been a, some sort of, I get that there's been some sort of connection between communities in Georgia and Azerbaijan, between the Udis. How's the situation now? Um, yes, um, uh, back then, it, it, uh, you know, there were lots of going back and forth still 
people had relatives who stayed behind uh, in, in what is now Aarhus, in back then was Vatashan, uh, and they would just visit back and forth. You know, people from there would visit Zinobiani, and people from Zinobiani would visit from Zinobiani would visit them. There was no problem with communicating. They would communicate in Udi language, obviously, of the same dialect. Um, but after the breakup of the Soviet Union, especially, uh, after the hard borders were introduced between the countries, that was another issue for people that became a challenge to visit their, their friends and relatives often uh, across the border. Also, uh, in the 90s, there was a, was a terrible situation, as you know, in the, in the entire region, economically and otherwise, so people couldn't travel much. Um, and afterwards, the younger generations, because they, um, there was this break in the connection for several years, and the younger generations, most of them no longer could speak Udi here in Georgia, um, less and less people started going to, to, um, to Azerbaijan, to the, to the Udi communities there. And even less people were coming to Zinobiani. Uh, from Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan Sudi communities. Um, but there are still some exceptions and, and we also have a, a plan uh, for the next year during a celebration of this hundred years of establishment of Zinobiani to bring some young people to back to their historic homeland from Georgia to Azerbaijan uh, to visit Oros, to visit Nij probably and uh, the area surrounding it and to just uh, introduce the younger people from these two communities again, reintroduce them to each other. As you have mentioned, social media plays a huge role here. And I would also like to touch the role of religion in Udi communities. Uh, as for Azerbaijan, it was the one of the main points that kept uh, them their community intact. But you are living in Georgia, who share the same religion for you, with you. Uh, how does it affect the community? Um, yes, that's a very good question because that became one of the most challenging issues uh, for the Georgian Udi community when it comes to preserving their own identity. Because when they moved here, they realized that majority of the population here, obviously, and they knew it beforehand as well, uh, were Christians. Back in Soviet times, that really didn't matter much. But later on, especially after the breakup of the Soviet Union as well, um, they also realized that there was no um, difference when it came to, to religion. And that meant that, that one of the stumbling blocks uh, when it came to marriages was taken away. Hence, we had a huge rise in mixed families, in Georgian Udi families, which in turn meant, as I mentioned, that the Udi language was no longer spoken as actively within the families. Um, and within the village then, in Zinobiani. Uh, and that's why, actually, the only differentiating thing for many people nowadays, when it comes to the community, is the language itself, the Udi language, because they don't see any other differences these days. They look at this uh, people of mixed families that have both Georgian and Udi background, they look at the people of the same religion, but then, you know, if the language is spoken, uh, then it's completely different, you know, and that underlines this uh, uniqueness or a separate identity of the community. Uh, so that's how religion affected basically uh, this issue of preserving your own identity. And the language in Georgia became the only, only um, uh, aspect of the identity that has, uh, that has remained different between the, the, the rest of the Georgian society or the majority of the Georgian, Georgian society and the Udi community locally in Zinobiani. Let's talk about Caucasian Albania. Obviously, so, it's a major point in history that shaped the identity of Udis and probably led to their preservation as well. Caucasian Albanian identity, although sometimes being you know, forgotten even within the Udi community, especially in Georgia over the years, um, is now becoming a focal point for many people within the community, especially the younger people, because they're realizing that they had a rich sort of, you know, history and cultural heritage that is connected to the Caucasian Albania and the Caucasian Albanian heritage. And also when it comes to the script and to the alphabet, that's a, it's a, there is a, there's a matter of 
pride for some young people, uh, especially because most of them are no longer able to speak their own language. And once they hear that they once their ancestors had their own alphabet and writing and script, they really want to learn it. And maybe through that, they also want to learn their own language again, the Udi language itself. So that's one of the, you know, that would be one of the instruments when it comes to preserving the language itself. But also I think the script can be actively reintroduced, although it is very an, an ambitious uh, project, I would say, and we'd have to start from the very young age, obviously, and people would have to have a reason to communicate in this uh, using this script. But I think, you know, for many people these days, from what I observe within the community, it is becoming a matter of pride to some sense to connect their past to this Caucasian Albanian kingdom. And because of that, I think also to the Caucasian Albanian heritage, especially the script and the, you know, the writing system and the, um, the language itself. So I think personally me, I would think I would be delighted if uh, somehow this Caucasian Albanian script could be reintroduced or, or preserved in one way or another, but also obviously researched and studied more uh, in one way or another. Thank you for your con uh, contributions. And I was... Thank you for also having me over. I was uh, thinking about doing this podcast for a long time, but since because like borders were closed and stuff, mm. uh, I had really uh, mm. have much harder time. But mm. we have made it, and thank you guys for listening. Uh, you can see at the description to the links to Civic Hall and Alexander's projects, and as well as mine. So have a good day and thanks for listening.